This week's parsha is called Vayera. Vayera means and he appears, and God appeared. And it starts off, the first sentence essentially starts off with God appearing to Abraham, who is ailing, and he's recovering from his circumcision they just underwent at the end of last week's parsha. Before we, we get into the specifics, I think this parsha is really interesting and intriguing and a little bit perplexing because it begins, bookended with events that could not be possibly more different. The first event is the description of Abraham's encounter with the three strangers, and he does kindness on levels almost unimaginable. We'll go through that in detail, what he does. And the last event is the description of the binding of Isaac, where Abraham essentially tries to engage in child sacrifice and kill his own son, which... I would ask my kids to verify, but it seems like it's a very unkind thing to do. So we're bookended by these these really opposite events, and it's really strange that in one parsha we'd be given uh, such opposing, uh, polar opposite descriptions of Abraham's character. That's, I think, number one. But number two, it, it's really more granular than that. You'll notice that there's another major event that Abraham does, and that's his intercession on behalf of Sodom. The Almighty tells him that I'm going to destroy the city of Sodom, Sodom and Gomorrah. And Abraham does everything he can to try to find favor, find benefit, and find vindication and exoneration for the people of Sodom and Gomorrah. Uh, Once again, an act of kindness. He has his enemies, the people that stand for everything that Abraham comes to oppose, and Abraham, if Abraham finds out they're about to be destroyed, and what does he do instead of celebrating? He tries to find a way to get them off the hook and save them. And then there's another event which seems to be a little bit opposing to that, where Abraham has, has his other son, Ishmael. He's starting to be a troublemaker, be a rowdy teenager. And his wife, Sarah, says, okay, why don't you uh, send him, banish him away? And uh, he's disappointed about that, but the wife says, okay, take Ishmael and send him away, banish him. And to me, that also sounds like an act of unkindness, or not lack of kindness, to have your own son, to give him a loaf of bread, give him a jug of water, good luck. Uh, go out in the, in, into, the, into the wilderness and hope, hopefully manage to send me a postcard. So we have this really um, competing vision of what Abraham is, and it seems to be a little bit inconsistent, where Abraham, initially, at the beginning of the Parsha, is doing these acts of fantastic kindness on one hand, End of the parsha, he's behaving very differently, doing unkind things, banishing his son, and attempting to sacrifice his own child. And I think that this parsha, essentially, as it unfolds, it's going to teach us about kindness in a lot of different ways. So let's let's dig into this. So what we left off with Abraham, he was circumcised at the age of ninety-nine. Uh, from what I've gathered, I've spoken to people who have had circumcision at a later age in life, and it's astonishingly painful, especially as, as time progresses. And Rashi tells us that this is that this was the third day after a circumcision. And I had a friend of mine in, in Israel who received a circumcision in his 30s. He says, when the Torah says that the third day is the worst, they were right. So Abraham is circumcised days of 199. We'll round it up to 100. He's in tremendous pain. And the Almighty comes to visit him. That's the first verse of the parasha. Abraham sitting outside of his tent in the heat of the day, and the Almighty appears. Now, why is Abraham sitting outside, and why is it hot? So we're told two different reasons. Abra- it's hot because the heat is going to help Abraham heal, number one. But also, Abraham was a person of kindness his whole life. We're told about his four doors that he had to his tent. He always welcomed, was always welcoming guests. But now he's in recovery. He just had his operation. He's in recovery. And the Almighty says, maybe take a few days off from your kindness uh, enterprise. And therefore, he made it so hot that no one's outside. It's 112 degrees. Everyone's staying inside in the air conditioning. But Abraham's still outside because Abraham is so dejected that he cannot do kindness. And this is the first uh, insight into Abraham's kindness, that his kindness was not a product of another person's need. It was a product of an internal desire to do kindness. Abraham wasn't saying, oh, I, I, now I have an excuse not to do kindness. I'm old. I'm recently circumcised. It's so hot. There's no one outside anyhow. Instead, Abraham goes outside and he's lamenting the fact that there are no guests. 
Now, the Almighty comes to visit him. That's the first verse. And the next verse, right away, what happens? He re- lifts his eyes, and he sees, and behold, there's three men, which we learn later are angels masquerading as men, and they're right there. W- what happens next is a little bit surprising. So Abraham is really old. He's recently circumcised. It's the heat of the day. God comes to visit him, and... He sees it right away, three wary travelers, which he later re- recognizes are pagans. The pagans are people that don't believe in God and people that Abraham came to oppose. And now he has God visiting him and then instantly he has guests and he's essentially faced with a dilemma. He has to ignore one of them. Does he ignore the travelers and let them pass by? Because now he's having prophecy. Now, we talk about Abraham as a prophet. Last week's power show, we read Abraham about, I think, four or five prophecies. So you would imagine he was, pro- he was prophesizing all the time. But still, to prophesize, that's the greatest experience someone could possibly have. And Abraham is given the opportunity to have prophecy. On the other hand, he sees three weary travelers, and he has to choose to ignore one. So what does he do? Does he ignore God and deal with the travelers? Or does he ignore the travelers and deal with God? And I was thinking as a way to explain this. Imagine, you know, you have an opportunity to meet a president or a king or a religious leader or someone who's one of your heroes. Obviously, that's not as transformative as meeting God. But imagine, let's just for argument's sake, you're, you have the opportunity to meet the president and to talk to them. And then the corner of your eye, you see... A homeless vagabond who's asking for money for food. Would, it, it would be crazy for us to imagine someone say, uh, excuse me, Mr. President, just wait, wait one minute. I'll be right back. I just have to tend to this other, it'll be insane, right? And yeah, that's exactly what Abraham does. Abraham makes this really strange decision to abandon God and tell God, one minute, please don't leave, which he wasn't sure at the time that God would actually listen. Please don't leave. I have to go tend to the needs of these three wary pagans. And in fact, the Talmud teaches us that Abraham taught us a lesson. There's actually a halacha that's derived from this story. It's greater to invite guests than to have prophecy. That's the lesson learned from this story. And I think the, the insight behind it is that in this world, we're here to do mitzvahs, not to have experiences. Experiences, that's something that we'll leave for Lama Ba. This world is the only place we can actually do mitzvahs. The Mishnah tells us, one second of, of tshuva and maizim tovim, of mitzvahs in this world, is greater than all of Lama Ba. Lama Ba is a world of consumption, a world of reward, of experiences. Here, we're here to work. And what does the word mean? It means to change yourself, become a better person. How do you do that? One of the best ways is via kindness. Abraham is given an opportunity to experience Olam Abba, to have prophecy, to have such a transcend- transcendental experience. And he puts that aside. He says, I'll put that aside. Wait, God. I'll be right back. Let me go deal with this real mitzvah that's here. That's my, my opportunity to do that. No matter how transcendental an experience is, it pales in comparison with the opportunity of even what we would consider perhaps to be a minor mitzvah. There was a story with Rabbi Israel Salanter, who was one of the transformative Torah personalities of the 19th century. He was in the middle of praying. And he hears two people behind him arguing. Who are these two people? These were members of the Hever Kadisha. Hever Kadisha is the burial society. Two members of the burial society, <laughs> and they're both a little lazy and they're tired, and there's a dead guy, Nebuch, right? There's a poor dead guy. And they're both saying, no, why don't you do it? You go did the great. You do it. And I said, like, nah, I'm tired. I did the last one. Why don't you do this? And Israel, Israel Salante hears this. And he's like, wait a minute. There's people, there, there, there's a body that's, that no one wants to bury. That's a mace mitzvah. That's one of the biggest mitzvahs in the Torah, to bury someone who has no other, bur- no, no other people to bury him. He quickly takes off his tefillin and goes and starts to dig in the grave himself. Yes, you're saying the Shema. You're experiencing, you're, you're connecting to God. And it's a wonderful, deep, transcendental, spiritual ecstasy that you could have. But a mitzvah that's real, that's that's present, that even supersedes that. And that's a tremendous lesson. And that's one that we learn from, from Abraham. Now, 
if you actually dig into the uh, the nuts and bolts of what happened. So the verse tells the second verse in the, in the parsha. He lifted his eyes, and he saw, and behold, there were three men standing there, and he saw, and he ran towards them from the entrance of the tent, and he bowed before them. This this verse actually repeats a verb twice. It says, and he saw, and he saw. What's interesting is that the only other episode in the Torah that has a description of a double vision, to my knowledge, is Moses. The first episode we're told about Moses, that Moses went out, he grew up and he went out, this is in chapter 2 of Exodus, and he went to see in his the, the suffering of his brethren, and he saw an Egyptian man hitting a uh, Hebrew man of his brother, brethren. That's in Ex- Exodus chapter 2. And it's interesting that Moses and Abraham, the two greatest personalities in the Torah and two greatest humans that have ever lived, both of them have this description of double vision. They see and they see. And Rashi tells us quite simply is that Abraham saw three travelers, but did he really see them? Yeah, he did. He saw them. He noticed them. He understood them. He perceived what was going on. What this means is when we see, we see from our vantage point. What Abraham and Moses saw when they saw, they saw from someone else's vantage point. For us, when we do kindness, we have to sometimes be given a flag. Oh, there's someone who needs kindness. Because we're not used to seeing the needs of others. Abraham saw, yeah, he saw like we all see, but then he saw from their perspective, and he independently knew that there's people there who need kindness, and he didn't wait to be prompted to deliver, to say, oh, give us some food or anything like that. He saw on his own because he had this double vision to see the world from other people's perspective. And this shows us really what kindness really is. Kindness is the transformation from single to double vision, perhaps we could say, or from seeing the world the way all of us see, which is from inside outward, to seeing the world from the perspective of others to notice their needs before they even make you aware of that. And what does he do? He runs to them. Can you imagine running with such an injury? And this is the first of five episodes where he runs. He runs and he starts bowing down. Strangers, total strangers. He abandons God, total strangers, and he starts this frantic frenzy of trying to tend to their needs. What does he do? First, he tells God, please, my Lord, if I find favor in your eyes, do not leave me. He tells the president, I have to deal with the kindness. One second, let me, don't leave. Put him on hold. And then he tells him like this, let some water be brought and wash your feet and recline behind, beneath the tree. He says, okay, first things first, let's relax, here's some water, clean off your feet and recline behind the tree. I'll get some bread. And... They say, okay, let's, let's begin this. And Abraham starts running. He runs again. He runs to Sarah and says, okay, let's make cakes. And then he runs to the cattle and he takes three cows. He wanted to produce for each one of them a, a tongue, which apparently is the most tasty part of the animal. So he made one of them for each one of them and he gives it to Ishmael, to the youth, to prepare it. He takes cream and milk and calf and he prepares it all, this wonderful 12 course meal, and he brings it back to them beneath the tree and they have a conversation. Eventually, he goes back to God. That's the story. It's it's striking, the, the contrast. On one hand, Abraham is presented with an opportunity to do a spiritual experience, and he says, kindness is more important. On the other hand, he could have had all the excuses in the world why he didn't want to do kindness or why this is an inopportune time, and he demanded that I want to do kindness. He had a need, almost a burning need to do kindness, and the description is over the top. He's running five times, he says, and he ran, and he ran, and he ran. And he's preparing this majestic meal, not just to give them something to eat so they shouldn't starve, and just tending to their needs, even though he, this is Abraham, 100 years old. Unbelievable description. I think the Torah tells us this story, and we know enough about Abraham, because if he did kindness in this manner at this point in time to these people, certainly he did this level of kindness to other people at other times. Abraham is so generous and so giving and so over the top Yet there's one thing he, that he tells, let a little bit of water. So the first verse says, let a little bit, some water be brought and wash your feet. Now, there's a few things to, to point out. First of all, why is he telling them to get water to wash their feet? Number one, before anything else. 
Number two, why he says, let some water be brought. Everything Abraham's doing himself, here he's outsourcing it to others. And number three, he says, a little bit of water. Abraham's giving them each an entire cow, yet when it comes to water, he only asks, Rashi points out, that this was the only part of this entire episode that he (laughs) gave others to do. Let some water be brought. Someone else should do it. And in fact, we're told, because Abraham did not do the kindness himself, he allowed other people to take care of the water. Therefore, when Abraham's descendants, when they're traveling in the wilderness, the water also came via an emissary. We know the man of the food, they might have just dropped it like rain. But the water, Moses had to encounter the rock. God says to Moses, okay, you give water to the people, talk to the rock, hit the rock as we read uh, the story. Why was water different than food? The answer is found over here. Because Abraham did the food himself, God said, okay, as a, mer- as, as a response, in merit of you on your own delivering food to the weary travelers, I'm going to give the food on my own. But the water you sent to someone else, therefore the water I'm going to send to someone else, i.e. Moses, Moses will have to be the go-between, the proxy to deliver the water from the rock. And what do we know as a result of that? Moses, instead of talking to the rock, he hits the rock, and as a result, he's not allowed to go into the land of Israel. As a result, Moshe is not in Israel, and the whole world history is different. So it's remarkable that when the episodes of the forefathers that seem to be arbitrary stories, right? It was good lessons, of course, but really the actions that they do create the spiritual merit and reward that lasts forever. And because Abraham outsourced the water, we essentially are punished that the Almighty outsourced the water and the result is the uh, that Moses wasn't allowed to go into the land of Israel uh, if you just follow the chain a little further. Now, he says a little bit of water. How come not a lot of water? And the answer to that is, well, Abraham was doing everything himself. When he has someone else do the water element of the operation, he doesn't say bring a lot of water, because you know why? Someone else would have to schlep it. Someone else would have to bring it. It's very nice to be uh, over the top in your generosity, but if that's going to cause someone else to have to do much more backbreaking work of schlepping the water from the well, then you can't say bring a lot of water. No, bring whatever you need, the minimum. So because Abraham had someone else do it, he said, bring a little water. There's a, there's a story, once again, from Rabbi Israel Salanter, where they, people used to wash their hands with water. There's mitzvahs in the Torah, to wash your hands in the morning, to wash your hands before you eat bread. And he once saw someone who was pouring lots of water to cover every square inch of his hand really well, because that's the mitzvah, right? You do the mitzvah properly. The mitzvah says do water, so do a lot of water. And then he noticed Rabbi Israel Salander is pouring, barely, barely covering his wrist. And he says, what's going on? He says, well, yeah, it's a mitzvah, but think about the guy who has to schlep the water out of the well. You're, you're pouring lavish amounts of water on your hand. It's going to cause him to have to schlep more water. What about thinking about that person? And that comes all the way from Abraham. If Abraham's going to send someone else to get the water for him, he's going to say, bring a little bit of water. What's the purpose of this water? Why is he telling him? These are not water to drink. It's water to wash their feet. Abraham recognized that these looked as, appeared to him as pagans. The pagans of that time would commonly bow down to the dust of their feet. Therefore, Abraham tells them, before you come into my house, you got to get rid of the idolatry, so to speak. You can't bow down to the dust of your feet. So this is the preliminary. This is interesting because we'll see this theme of washing your feet will appear several times in the Parsha. But what's clear is that the first thing that Abraham tells him is that in this house, there ain't no idolatry. So if you have your dusty feet, which may or may not be a uh, an element of idolatry, the first thing you do is you wash your feet. When Lot appears on our stage in the Parsha. And he also tells him to wash his feet, but the order is different. Where, whereas Abraham begins by telling them to wash their feet, Lot begins with everything else. And then, then afterwards, as an addendum, he tells them almost, you know, wash your feet after everything else is done. Now, another interesting 
quirk about Abraham's kindness here. He tells them, let me give you a little bit of bread. He starts them off, let's just have a little bit of bread. Uh, when he's proposing to do this meal, he says, I'm going to give you a little bit of bread. But ultimately, he pulls out livestock and starts making um, really a majestic meal. And the Talmud tells on this, the Talmud draws a lesson. From this we derive that tzaddikim, righteous people, they speak a little, but they do a lot. What Abraham, when he, when he told him, oh, I'll give you a meal, he didn't describe everything that he was actually going to do. When you talk about yourself and, and your plans, be the opposite of all talk, no action. So what happens? So he, he, he gives them the meal and he oversees them as they're eating. In fact, in the Talmud, we're given uh, descriptions of fabulous celebrations like weddings and the like, where all the rabbis are congregated at the weddings. And the greatest rabbi of them all, he's serving everyone. He's saying, oh, how are you possibly serving us? You're the greatest rabbi. And he says, well, if Abraham could do it to the pagans, I could do it to my fellow colleagues. Now, they have a conversation with him, and they ask him, where is Sarah? And Sarah's in the tent. And they pledge that I'm going to return in a year, and Sarah will have a child. And Sarah's overhearing from the back that these three pagans are making a prediction that 99-year-old Abraham and 90-year-old Sarah, in a year's time, will have a child. And Sarah starts laughing because this is absolutely hilarious. Uh, because she's old, and her husband is old, and is it really possible for such old people, and especially her husband, he's 100 years old, that they could possibly have a child? And the Almighty interjects back into the story and tells Abraham, why is Sarah laughing? Why is she saying, oh, I'm so old that I can possibly have a child? So what's interesting here is a few things. First of all, is Sarah's laughing justified? Apparently it seems like it's not. She's being called out for it. Even though she thought that the three strangers, the three visitors, the three travelers, were random pagans. And when they're making a prediction, oh, you're going to have a wonderful year, and at the end of the year you're going to have a new baby, that's, I mean, that's comical. Especially her husband's so old, she's so old. It seems like her, she shouldn't have laughed. Even if someone offers you wishes of good tidings, and the person is not necessarily someone who's righteous or is saying things that seem to be logical, you have to, when someone gives you a blessing, you say amen. That's what you say, whether or not it seems likely to happen. Now, the next part is that God tells Abraham, well, why is Sarah laughing? And the Almighty actually switches what Sarah is laughing about. When Sarah laughs, she laughs that, oh, my husband is so old, there's no way, he's not having any more kids. When the Almighty tells over uh, this episode to Abraham, he says that Sarah said, oh, I'm so old, I can't possibly have children. It seems like the Almighty is changing the narrative. Sarah initially said, Abraham's so old. And when, when the Almighty repeated this to Abraham, he said that Sarah said that Sarah's so old. What's going on? So Rashi tells us, the Gemara tells us, that the Almighty actually changed the truth because of peace. If Abraham had known that Sarah said, oh, my husband, <laughs> he's so old, he's not having any kids that would cause a little bit of a you know, schism, a little, little fight, so to speak. It's a little, you know, it could have escalated, right? And instead, the Almighty says to Abraham that Sarah said that, oh, I'm so old, which both of them are legitimately true, but which one would she, was she harping on? She was harping on his age and not her age. And we learn from this that there are instances where lying is actually the correct way to, to act. Talmud tells us that you're allowed to lie in three there's three areas where you're allowed to lie. One of them is because of shalom, of peace. And the truth is that what does it mean to tell the truth and what does it mean to tell a lie? The signet of God is truth. So they might have said the truth because the truth is the appropriate thing to say. We think that the truth is what, well, what event actually happened and how we convey that. If we convey it in the correct way or in the precise manner that it actually happened, that's truth in truth. What truth is, 
to say what's correct. Sometimes it's correct to say what didn't actually happen. That is truth. Thus, the Mishnah could tell us that there's three things that the world stands on, and one of them is truth, and one of them is peace. Even though peace and truth are sometimes at odds, as in this instance, but it's not really at odds, because peace, what's peaceful is truthful, even if that is not exactly precisely what happened. Okay, so the men get up, they finish their meal. The men, they're still calling, they're still being called men. We don't, we don't have the reveal yet that they were actually angels. And the Almighty continues his conversation with Abraham and he tells him, he tells himself almost, that how could I possibly withhold from Abraham my intentions? My intentions are that these angels continue to Sodom and Gomorrah and to destroy it. The outcry of Sodom and Gomorrah is great because they're such sinners. Their sin is very grave. I'm going to descend and see what's going on, and I'm going to destroy them. It's actually interesting if you compare the description of the run-up to the flood and the description to the run-up of the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah and Amorah, they're very similar, the way the mind describes it. It seems like Sodom and Gomorrah is like the flood story on a more localized level, on a more regionalized level. They also had sinned to a degree that it became irreparable and, and, they, and, and, uh, it couldn't possibly undo the, uh, the iniquity and therefore they had to be destroyed. And then Abraham begins a very lengthy efforts to try to intercede on their behalf. He starts saying, well, would you destroy them if there were 50 righteous people? And the man says, no, and the inspector's not 50. And there's maybe, the, what if there's 40? What if there's 30? What if there's, 20 and eventually 10. And the Almighty says, I won't destroy them if there's 10. And uh, the narrative concludes, oh, there ain't even 10 righteous people in the city. Therefore, there's nothing to do about it. The episode concludes, the Almighty left, the Almighty left Abraham, and Abraham returned to his place. So there's a few interesting things here to unpack. Why did Abram stop at, at 10? Abram stopped at 10 because Abram took a, took a lesson from Noah's playbook. Noah, it was Noah and his three sons and Noah's wife and the wives of Noah's. There's a total of eight people. So Abraham knew that history and he said, well, if there's eight righteous people, that's not enough. So the minimum that he would imagine to save the sinners would be 10. Now, the reason why he started off with 50, because Sodom and Gomorrah, there was actually a cluster of five different cities. So he, he thought maybe he could get 10 from each city to save that, that uh, respective, their respective cities. And then he was just, you know, once, you know, if maybe there's 40 to save four cities, etc., and down to 10 to save 10 cities. Now, Lot was righteous, but he wasn't righteous to the degree that his righteousness would save the entire city, would save himself, maybe his family but not everyone else. There's a, a little bit of a historical note here that's particularly of interest to me. Uh, my great-grandfather was uh, an unbelievable scholar and Torah leader who lived in Lithuania. His name was Rabbi Abraham Grzynski. And unfortunately, he lived in Slabotka, which is a uh, suburb of Kovna, which is the, one of the major cities in Lithuania. And that was, of course, captured by the, uh, by the Germans in 1941. And he was in the ghetto there. And it's really a remarkable story what him and his students were doing in the ghetto under harsh, really harsh conditions. They took this story that said, there's, if you have 10 people, you can save a city. And they said, we're going to become the 10 people. For years, in the ghetto, in terribly harsh and really un, un, unimaginable conditions, they try to do whatever they can to become righteous and as a result of that save the city and just just for the sake of, of, of interest I think, you know, for us as people who didn't experience the Holocaust, it's very hard for us to say anything about it. It's very I feel like it's a little callous, you know, it's a little insensitive for people who didn't experience any of the, the horrors of the Holocaust to cast judgment in any way. But someone who did, and someone who was living in the ghetto, uh, their insight and their perspective is very valuable. So he determined, he found 12 different reasons 
that him and his students, over the course of years living in the ghetto, what they determined would be their the reason. What are the reasons why the Jewish people had to suffer? What did they abandon of Torah that caused the, uh, the such a terrible uh, inferno to befall our people? And, you know, if I were to say this, you would say, who are you to say this? And any one of us were to say this, who are we? But someone who's there in the thick of things and trying to save the people, and he says that he determined, they determined together the 12 reasons why the Holocaust happened. I think it's very interesting. Uh, at least it's, or uh, it's intriguing. What are these 12 reasons? Number one, emuna, faith. Number two, observance of Shabbos. Number three, taharat mishpacha, which is uh, family purity. Number four, careful not to eat non-kosher foods. Number five, ribis, usury. Number six, chinuch habanim b'derech ha educating children in the ways of Torah. Number seven, bitot which is abandoning Torah. Number eight, loving your fellow, loving the Jewish people. Number nine, chesed, kindness. Number ten, self-sufficiency, to not need a lot, not be very needy. Number eleven, Betachon, faith in God, reliance in God. And lastly, love of, love of Israel. And in fact, how we actually got this, this was smuggled out. Because he, unfortunately, on the 22nd day of Tammuz, 1944, he was in a hospital that the Germans just burned down the whole hospital. We actually have accounts of what he was doing the day before in the hospital trying to comfort all the people. Really, really remarkable. Uh, but one of his students who was there in the ghetto managed to survive and he told us about these uh, about these conventions that they had uh, and and these 12 reasons that they determined were the cause of the Holocaust, which is just remarkable. It's mm-hmm. scary also. To me, it's someone who's experiencing themselves, who's a Torah scholar beyond anything any one of us could ever imagine, who says this, it, re- it really, it really resonates. Um, that being said, of course, uh, they weren't successful. Maybe they, maybe they were successful in saving some of the individuals. It's possible that, you know, it was too late. Um, who knows? But either way, the notion of 10 people creating a certain spiritual power that is greater than the sum of the parts is found over here, and that's enough to save the city, and was used to try to save the uh, people uh, suffering um, in the Holocaust. Okay, so what happens? So Abraham tries to intercede on behalf of Sodom, and he's unsuccessful. God goes back. Abraham goes back. There's a Mishnah in the chapters of our fathers that tells us that we should be mitalmidav shel Avram Avinu. We should try to become, to strive to be the students of Abraham and not the students of Bilam. There's a lot of compare contrasts that we could draw between Abraham and Bilaam, the villain of the Torah that we meet in the book of Numbers. Abraham has enemies. The enemies are the people that stand for everything Abraham's trying to <coughs> counteract. And in no place is this personified and embodied more than the city of Sodom. When Abraham finds out that his enemies are about to be vanquished, he doesn't jump on the table and start dancing. He's not jubilant. He starts praying to save his enemies. Bilaam also had enemies. The enemies were the Jewish people. And he also prayed. But he prayed not to save the, his enemies, but to destroy his enemies. And furthermore, what happened when Bilaam prayed to try to destroy the Jewish people? It was unsuccessful, and the Almighty said, you can't give him a, ble- a curse, you have to give him a blessing. So what did Abilam do? He saw his prayer was unsuccessful. He said, huh, maybe it's the vantage point. Maybe it's the place. And he moves to a different mountaintop and tries it again. When that's unsuccessful, he moves to yet a third mountaintop. And each time he's forced to give a blessing. When Abraham is unsuccessful with his prayer, he realizes that the prayer or him or whatever is not worthy. He's willing to look internally and say there's something lacking with me or with my efforts. Bilaam, on the other hand, never considered that maybe the flaw lied with him and with his motives. He prays he's unsuccessful. He says, well, it must be that it was just some other random factor. Let's move to a different mountaintop and maybe that will, uh, that will lead uh, to, uh, to desired results. Now, these two stories that we start off the partial with, number one, the description of Abraham's kindness with the 
angels, and number two, the description of Abraham's kindness with his enemies trying to pray on their behalf, are really the two major stories we're told about Abraham's kindness. What's surprising is that both of these acts of kindness were fruitless. Angels don't need food. Abraham preparing a magnificent meal for them, and they make believe like they're eating, but the truth is they don't need food. So it doesn't actually yield results for the recipient. Additionally, Abraham prays and is unsuccessful in securing exoneration for the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. If the Torah wants to tell us stories about Abraham's kindness, doesn't it make sense, perhaps, to tell us kindness that actually matter to the recipient? Why would the Torah specifically tell us stories of kindness where there was no practical, tangible result to the recipient? And I think that's the lesson. The lesson is that Abraham, who is the paragon of kindness, He's teaching us a lesson here. The Torah is teaching us a lesson. Kindness is for oneself. Abraham, there's no, it's so hot outside, there's no one there who, uh, who's traveling. Everyone's indoors. What does Abraham do? There's no one that has a need, but Abraham has the need. He has the need to do kindness. Kindness is to change oneself. Not necessarily by helping others. If you think about it, I want to help someone. You know who's a lot better at helping someone than me? God. If kindness was about helping people, we could say, well, God is a lot better than all of us at trying to help people. So what's the point of doing kindness? In fact, wouldn't it be more efficient to allow God to take care of people? He's much better after all than we are. The answer is, is that the needs of others, all that is artificial. It's all to create an opportunity for the giver to give. The Talmud tells us, If I give charity to a poor person, I'm doing him a favor. But you know who's doing even a bigger favor? The poor person is doing me a a bigger favor. Why? He gets a few dollars. I get a mitzvah of eternal eternal power. I get an opportunity to change. I get an opportunity to resist my Yetzirah. I get an opportunity to do the will of the Almighty. That is worth a lot more than than the one I gave him. So really, where is the transaction? We're used to think of the transaction to be recipient-based. What do they need? How do I give it to them? Because they need. The truth is, I need something more than they need something. And they're just a proxy. They're just an, an opportunity for me to achieve my transformative change. Abraham doesn't say, oh, these people are hungry. Uh, why don't you guys get them some food? No, well, he could have, right? And it would have been legitimate. He had enough people there. And he was very sick and very old. But Abraham realized that the opportunity was for him. It's not based upon the needs of others. It's based upon his personal need for transformation and change. And therefore, he wanted to do it himself in such a grandiose way. And the Torah specifically points out, oh, you know what? There was no benefit for the recipient. And that's still the best kind of, uh, of, best kind of kindness. Because that is really what the transformation is. Now, what's more? So where's the transformation? What's really bizarre, or at least intriguing, about Abraham is that we know if we were to describe Abraham's, uh, you know, what's his epithet? What is his legacy? We would say he's the founder of monotheism, founder of the great monotheistic religions. He taught us about God. You open up the Torah, and you see where he tells God, wait one minute, I'm going to deal with the kindness. And kindness is interpersonal between man and man, And faith is between man and God, and they don't seem to really be correlated very much. Is it possible that Abraham has had, is so divergent, he had such divergent capabilities and qualities? It seems a little strange. But the truth is, Abraham's kindness and Abraham's faith were both a product of the same core internal transformation. We have a Yetzirah, an evil inclination. Evil inclination, is, we're told, is an alternative to God. It's a foreign God within us. This foreign God wants us to not do kindness and to not recognize God. Thus, to have faith means to open up your heart to God. To have kindness means to open up your heart to your fellow. Both of them are about unlocking and undoing and untethering yourself from your Yetzirah. They're both linked to each other. If someone has faith but doesn't have kindness 
that demonstrates that the faith is lacking. Says the Talmud, whoever studies Torah but doesn't do kindness, well, you're studying Torah, you're connecting to God. Yeah, but you're, it's, it's as if you don't believe in God. Why? Because what does it mean to believe in God? It means to actually open up your heart to remove the influence of the Yetzirah and to allow God to come into your heart. Well, if your heart is locked up to your fellow, it's obvious that the Yetzirah is still in command and in control and in dominion of your heart. So they're really both the same thing. They're both at its core rooted in faith as well. That's why Abraham, they come in, they have the little uh, flecks of idolatry on their feet, the dust. What does he tell them? Before anything, wash your feet. In Abraham's view, delivering kindness is an act of faith. You can't do an act of faith when there's idolatry clear and present. you got to first remove the idolatry because that is in direct conflict with faith. When we're going to meet Lot in a second, we'll see he tells him to wash his feet, but that's after everything. Lot had an entirely different perspective on kindness. Not on faith, on kindness. His kindness was removed from God. It was something on its own merit, which may be good in a vacuum, but we'll see it really led him astray. It really, He made a lot of critical missteps because of his perspective. And by the way, just to bring this full circle here, or at least semicircle, Abraham, he saw and he saw. He saw and he noticed the world from other people's perspectives. The only way you could possibly notice to recognize the world from someone else's perspective is if you don't have a Yetzirah. Yetzirah is a force of selfishness. To see the world from someone else's perspective, to have the double vision of Abraham and Moses, that is predicated upon someone already having removed the Yetzirah's influence from within them. Okay, so what happens? These angels, they leave Abraham and they head, two of them head to Stone, one of them to destroy Stone, and one of them to save Lot. And who do they meet when they get to Sodom? They meet Lot himself. Lot, of course, is Abraham's nephew. And what does Lot do? The two angels come to Sodom in the evening, and Lot was sitting in the gate of, uh, of Sodom, of Sodom. And Lot saw, how many times did he see him? Only once. And stood up to meet them, and he bowed face to the ground. He's a little bit of a, he's a knock version of Abraham. He also saw them, and he also bowed. But there's a few things in the middle that he missed. So what does he tell him? And lo, he speaks to them, Behold, my lords, turn about, please. Come come to my house, spend the night with me. First he tells them to spend the night, and then he tells them, And wash your feet, and wake up early and go your way. Lot is also telling them to wash their feet. But Lot, Lot is almost a copycat. He, he spent a lot of time with Abraham. And he saw when, you, when guests come, you see them and you run and you bow down to them. That's what he saw a million times with Abraham. That's what he copied. He also saw that Abraham made sure everyone washes their feet. But Lot doesn't actually get every, how everything, you know, how the pieces actually work. So what does he tell him? Spend the night and wash your feet. And Lot was a really a wonderful person, but Lot didn't have the same levels of kindness that Abraham did, as we'll see. So what does he tell him? He tells him, wash your feet, but first spend the night. Abraham, before anything, says wash your feet. Ab- Lot's kindness was not predicated on faith. It was copy, copying Abraham. Now Rashi points this out, and he tells us that Lot, he, he didn't care so much about it. To him, the order didn't really matter so much. What's more, Rashi gives us another reason. Listen to this. We know that the people of Sodom were, were very antagonistic to the notion of kindness. The Midrash tells us that the, the episode that really pushed them over the top towards evil was there was a young girl who had clandestinely given money and food and sustenance and nourishment to a poor person. And the people of the town were so outraged about this that they took her and they killed her in a really horrible way. They lathered her with honey and they la- they had all the bees come and bite her. That's what they did. That's the, the story in the Midrash. And there's other stories in the Talmud, some funny stories in the Talmud as well about the city of Sodom because Eliezer, the Abraham's emissary, he would travel, he was traveling for Abraham. He was uh, like the uh, scouting report for Abraham to tell him, okay, which cities can we go and teach Torah to, teach about God to? So he ended up once in the city of Sodom. In the city of Sodom, everything was perverted. Everything was corrupted. In fact, if someone punched you and broke your nose, you had to pay them. Why? Because there was an ancient practice called bloodletting. 
Bloodletting means you go to the doctor, you go to the physician, and the physician withdrew blood from you. So this guy punched you in the face and made you bleed. So you have to pay him as a, for his services, his, his, his services as a physician. So Eliezer walks into the town. There's a Talmud. Talmud in, in Sanhedrin gives us a whole list of stories about Eliezer in, uh, in Sodom. So Eliezer goes to town and some guy walks up to him and punches him in the face. So he's like, what's going on? He runs quickly, grabs the guy, goes to the court. And he tells the court, this guy's punched me in the face. You should pay me, right? I want to sue him. So they tell him, no, actually, you have to pay him. What? Why? I have to pay him? Why do I have to pay him? Well, he did your blood letting for you. You got to pay him, whatever the market rate is. So Eliezer runs over to the judge, punches him in the face. He says, oh, now you owe me. Instead, you just pay him. <laughs> uh, and a bunch of stories like that. Um, when they had visitors, they would always invite visitors to come in and uh, stay, in the, stay in the bed. They made a bed for him. And uh, they would tell him, oh, this is your bed. And the, the visitor would come in, not knowing any better. And if the visitor was a little taller, they'd say, okay, we're going to chop off your legs to make sure the bed fits. Really, really perverted behavior. And if, le- and if he was too short, they'd stretch him out until he fits. Just really brutal butchery that they that they would uh, p- partake in. Just unbelievably horrible stuff. And by the way, we know through history there are there were people that at least... To, uh, to, uh, to some extent, behave like those communities. One more story that Talmud tells us about him, about the city of Sodom, is that whenever a poor person would pass by, everyone would give them a gold coin. A gold coin that had etched upon it the face of the homeowner. So if someone says, comes to the door, oh, I'm, I'm so poor, could you help me? He says, sure, and he invites them in, gives them a gold coin. Gold coin with the image of the homeowner in it. Wow, wonderful. And he goes to the next house, and same thing. Everyone keeps on giving these gold coins with the picture, with the signet of the owner. And then he goes to the store with his badger coins and says, I'm sorry, we don't sell to foreigners. So he has all these coins and he tries every store in town to try to get food and he can't get any food or drink or no one will give him anything. His, his, his currency is meaningless and the guy would just die. After they would die, they'd pick up the gold coins and everyone would take back their coin for the next guy. Really, it's real perversion on a, on a horrible scale. So Lot... He was someone who was really torn. He, he was a member of that city. And a, on another hand, a disciple of Abraham. And he liked to do kindness. But if he would do a kindness in the open, they would kill him. That's, that's, that's what they did. So he sees the, um, the weary travelers. And they have, once again, they have dust in their feet. So he tells them, why don't you stay for the night and then wash your feet? And this was really a gambit. Lot's gambit was... That let's say the townspeople find that Lot is, high, is hosting a guest. They'd walk into his house and say, where's that guest? I say, and Lot will be able to say, well, look, his, his feet are still dusty. They just arrived. He was scared of the possibility that his kindness might be his undoing. And therefore he said, stay the night and only later wash your feet. That's an alternative reason why Lot first told him to stay and then told them to wash their feet the next day. And I think Rashi gives us two separate reasons why there's a discrepancy between Abraham and Lot vis-a-vis the order of washing your feet. I think there's a, there's a tremendous lesson here. Lot did kindness, but not because of God. Not because Abraham had this faith-based kindness. Says Rashi, if a person has kindness, but totally... Uh, uh, totally divested from God, from faith, they actually won't be dedicated to the kindness. They'll be scared of any repercussions. They'll do kindness, but because God's not involved, therefore, they're scared to commit on one hand. He was worried about saving his skin. He, he withdrew from total commitment. And furthermore, from the fact that we see that Lot was not so careful about idolatry. He said, ah, oh, stay the night, then, then we'll deal with the idolatry on your on the dust of your feet till the next day. Then we see he's obviously does not have the higher levels of faith in God, and therefore he doesn't rely that God will save him from the townspeople. If you don't have faith in God, you're worried about every possible permutation and every possible variable could jump upon you. Reliance on God means to rely on God. If you rely on God, then you know that doing good won't cause you harm. Therefore, when we see that he's worried that the, that the good that he's doing perhaps may cause him harm, that reflects on his lack of faith. So what happens? Lot invites him to his house, 
and the people of the town find out that Lot has guests, and they start converging upon the house of Lot. And they called to Lot and said to him, Where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out to us so that we may know them. What does Lot do? Lot walks out of the entrance, shuts the door behind him, and he says, I beg of you, my brothers, do not act wickedly. See, now, I have two daughters who have never known a man. I shall bring them out to you and do to them as you please. But to these men, do nothing, inasmuch as they have come under my under the shelter of my roof. There's something warped with Lot. Lot was a student of Abraham through and through. But he was a student who didn't quite get it. He didn't realize, like, these actions of kindness, there are some parameters for it. In Lot's mind, the notion of kindness, above all, that he saw with Abraham, Abraham is such superlative kindness, that is what's right. And even if it means forfeiting your own daughters, which is insane, why would he do that? But clearly, there's something corrupt about Lot. He's, on one hand, righteous, but he doesn't understand why he's righteous. He's not doing it the same reasons why. He's just copying Abraham. And he's doing a great job of copying, but because he doesn't understand the, the real motivation of Abraham and the, and the context for kindness, therefore he's willing to do such perverted, warped behavior to give up his own daughters. He did not learn that from Abraham. And we see what happens when someone studies and tries to emulate and tries to model his behavior after someone else, but doesn't do a good job or does too good of a job. He copies Abraham, whatever, which Abraham seems in Lot's eyes to have given up everything, even given up prophecy to tend to strangers. He's going to do the same, no matter what. I'll give up everything, obviously, and he takes it a step too far. So what happens? The angels, sort of speak, reveal themselves as angels. They go outside. They're not scared of the uh, people of Sodom. They strike them with blindness. And all the people start flailing about in the dark. And they quickly tell Lot with a sense of urgency, we're angels, we're going to destroy the city. You have time to leave, but not a lot of time. Gather your kids, your daughters, your sons-in-law, everyone. Let's get out of here. The Almighty's fed up with the city. We're going to destroy them. He calls up his son-in-laws, and they start laughing at him. Can you imagine your father-in-law calls you? We're leaving Houston. It's I guess people. I'm sure people have done that. We're moving to Canada, right? Right after the election, election. people do say that, uh, but yeah, but they don't do it. The, no, none of them actually do it. But it, it, it does sound strange. Lot obviously believes them. Lot has a certain sense of the of the possibilities. And he has a familiarity with the with the angels. But he tells his kids, and they start laughing at him. He's, he loads, totally lost it. Uh, the angels tell him, listen, whatever you have, we're going to destroy the city. We don't have a lot of time. They start fleeing. He, they make a very important instruction, don't turn back. What this means is, is that for someone to be saved, well, someone to save the entire city, they need to have 10 righteous people. To save yourself, you have to be righteous. But to save yourself and be able to look and see the downfall of the wicked, they weren't holding quite at that level of of piety. The angels warned them, you could be saved. However, to actually see what's befalling the wicked, that that you're you're not holding at. And therefore, he tells them, don't turn around. Now, what's interesting, just to hearken back to the, the Ark story, the Ark had a window. But Rashi brings two opinions. Did it have a window or was it some sort of stone that gave light? Rashi gives two opinions. And Rashi also gives two opinions as to the righteousness levels of Noah. Was he very righteous and would have been even more righteous in the times of Abraham? Or he was only righteous for his generation? It seems like the debate as to how righteous Noah was, that's the same debate. Was it a window or was it a stone? If it was a window, he could see the downfall of the wicked because he was righteous to the degree that he was, you know, beyond just mere saving, also to experience the downfall of the wicked. Now, Lot, they start, they're they're running away, and they're they're fleeing, and his wife makes the uh, ill-fated decision to turn around, and right away she becomes a pillar of salt. Why salt? So, uh, the principle is, is that when the Almighty punishes someone, it's always in direct line with their behavior. Whatever they did, that has to contribute to how they're punished. 
So Rashi tells us that his wife turned around and she became a, po- a pillar of salt. She sinned with salt, and therefore she was punished with salt. Why? How did she sin with salt? Lot would always invite guests. And when you invite guests, you make them meals. And when you make them meals, he wouldn't just give them bread, he would give them bread with salt. And she would say to him, she said to him, even this bad practice, i.e. of giving kindness, and giving kindness with salt, you want to bring to this city? And to me, this was always very surprising. No, uh, Lot is someone who is steeped in kindness to an incredible degree, and even too much, to even to give up his own kids. And his wife could be antagonistic to kindness and say, well, give him bread, but don't give him salt. Like, that's, that's, you know, that's, that's a bridge too far. And Rashi points out that she stresses that you want to bring this bad practice to this city. Lot and Lot's wife and children, they were influenced by the city. The effect of the disdain to kindness that the city had rubbed off against them. And therefore they too started to get a, a feeling of, of, of disdain towards kindness, and that was manifest in their behavior. So she becomes a pillar of salt, and they are running away, and they're hiding, and they're just worried that the whole world is a total devastation. And the verse tells us that Abraham woke up, Abraham is, he's away from there, he rose in the morning to the place where he had stood before Hashem, and he knew that there was uh, destruction pending for the city of Sodom. He gazed down upon Sodom and Gomorrah, so he actually was able to look, and the entire surface of the land of the plain, and saw, and behold, the smoke of the earth rose like the smoke of a, of a fire. And so, and so it was when, Hashem, when God destroyed the cities of the plain that God, that God remembered Abraham, and he sent Lot from the midst of the upheaval where he, upturned, uh, where he overturned the city in which Lot had lived. I have a theory. The lowest point on the earth is in the Dead Sea region of Israel, which is essentially central Israel all the way to the east, where the Jordan River starts in the Kinneret, the Galilee, goes all the way down and turns into the Dead Sea. The Dead Sea is the saltiest water in the world. And it's right where these cities were. My theory is either that Lot... His wife turned into a pillar of salt, and it caused so much salt in the area, it caused the Dead Sea, to the water to become so polluted with salt. Theory number one. Perhaps theory number two. Maybe she became into a little vial of salt. But everyone who looked, who wasn't Abraham, who wasn't righteous enough to see the downfall of the wicked, they also turned into piles of salt. So the whole, everyone who looked, just salt, 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 salt everywhere. You have a Dead Sea. That's my theory. Don't call me out net. Abraham wakes up and he sees what's happening. Lot is still trying to get his way out of the city or out of the upheaval. And the, the verse really seems to inject something that seems out of place. And so it was when God destroyed the cities of the plain that God remembered Abraham. So he sent Lot from amidst the upheaval when he ever turned the cities in which Lot had lived. It seems a little strange. We're talking about the saving Lot but God remembers Abraham. So Rashi tells us that Lot had a merit with respect to Abraham when, in last week's parsha, when Abraham went down to Egypt and he told Pharaoh, oh, this is my sister, Lot, who happens to be the brother of Sarah, who knew very well that they were actually married, he kept his mouth quiet. Thus, when the Almighty is saving Lot, he remembers Abraham. He remembers what Abraham said and Lot was quiet. That's what Rashi tells us. Very strange idea here. Because we know if we're trying to find a merit for Lot, Lot obviously is demonstrating superlative kindness of his own right. He was a very kind person on one hand. On the other hand, if we're scanning Lot's career, and the only thing we can find is that when his brother-in-law and sister were with him in Egypt, he didn't let it know that they were actually married. It seems like a very minor merit, certainly when compared to the tremendous merits that he had done with, with these guests and we're sure with other guests as well. So the one of the ideas given, a lot of people ask this question, one of the ideas given is that when someone is going to be saved in in this context, their merit has to be their own. Lot was amazing in kindness. But 
Where did he get that from? He saw Abraham and he copied Abraham. And we see he copied it a little bit too much. But it wasn't his own inspiration. It wasn't his own action where he did it himself. Because he did not do it himself, he was influenced by Abraham. Therefore, that's not enough to save him. What is the one act, the one mitzvah that he did without any prompting? He kept his mouth quiet, not revealing to the authorities that Sarah was indeed Abraham's wife. Interestingly, going all the way back to the first, to Bereshus, Cain and Abel. Cain brings a sacrifice. Abel copies. He also brings a sacrifice. The Almighty accepts Abel's sacrifice and not Cain. And Cain kills Abel. Well, why did Abel die? Didn't he do a sacrifice? Didn't, doesn't he have a merit? But Abel also copied Cain. When, Cain, when, when, when Abel saw Cain bringing the sacrifice, he said, I'm going to copy. He copied it. Any act that you do that's copying, that's not enough to save you. Yes, he was righteous and he did a righteous act, but because that was not self-inspired, it wasn't enough to save him. Okay, so what happens? Lot uh, and his daughters are hiding out. They're hiding in a cave. They're obviously traumatized from what they just saw, what they just experienced. They think the world is coming to an end. It's apocalypse. Uh, and they're worried, oh no, we have to, this is like the times of Noah. Once again, they thought there are comparisons between this story and the story of the flood. We have to start from scratch. It's just us and our dad, the two daughters and the dad. The mother is now a pill- pillar of salt. They get him drunk. They have two babies with him. And those are the babies of Moab and Ben-Ami, which is this, the nation of Ammon. What is the meaning behind the name of Moab? The word Moab is similar to the word Me'av, from the father. She actually named her son from his progenitor, from the father. Even though there may have been justification for this, because they thought the world's over, right? They didn't know. They were hiding in a cave, terrified to leave. Still, I think it, it, it seems to be criticism for Lot, that Lot had to fall down to descend to such depths that is indicative of his own personal failings uh, as a person. Maybe we're not technically to blame. Okay, fine. But does the Torah really need to say that about him? And it, the Torah is revealing something about his personality that there was something wrong that allowed for such a mistake to happen and to be forever etched in the Torah to make us really look down at, you know, low father kids with his daughters. It's not really the highest praise. Okay, he was drunk still. Abraham and Sarah become pregnant, as it was foretold. They have a child, Isaac. Isaac is circumcised at eight days. Abraham is 100 years old when Isaac was born. They actually name him, very surprisingly, Yitzchak, which means laughter. It's surprising. Maybe that's something interesting about our nation. In our nation, it's, it's really funny, if you think about it, that we're still here, we're still vibrant. Sarah miraculously is able to nurse, we're told, even though she's really old. Not only that, all the ladies would bring their babies to her and she would nurse them as well. And he gets weaned and Abraham makes a big party, a celebration to celebrate the weaning of of Isaac. And as he's growing up, he has a rowdy teenager of a brother, Ishmael, who is also hanging around there. And this becomes a problem. Sarah saw the son of Hagar, the Egyptian, whom she had born to Abraham mocking, she saw he was behaving in a way that she didn't want to uh, negatively influence Isaac. And she tells Abraham, drive out the slave woman with her son, for the son of slave woman should not inherit with my son, with Isaac. And the matter greatly distressed Abraham. God said to Abraham, don't be distressed over the youth of your sl- or your slave woman. Whatever Sarah tells you, heed her voice, since through Isaac will offspring be considered yours. The son of the slave woman as well will I make a, into a nation, for he is your offspring. God tells Abraham to listen to Sarah. Why? Because his true legacy is going to be through Isaac. Indeed, Ishmael will be a great nation in his own right, but Isaac is going to be Abraham's legacy. And essentially, the man is telling him, banish your own son. So what does he do? He wakes up early in the morning. This is a theme that we'll see again in the, to- in the rest of the parsha. Abram is given an instruction to do something which he finds to be horrible, of course, to banish your own son. But because God tells him to do it, 
he does it, and he wakes up early in the morning. It's not going to delay it. Oh, let's delay it. No, wake up early. It's a mitzvah to do as well. He takes the bread. He takes the water. He gives it to Hagar <laughs> to to travel on the way. They take the boy. They go off, and they're in the desert. They finish all the food and water and provisions. The kid's getting sick. He's placed beneath the tree. She sits far away, and she starts praying. So the angel comes, and she says, what's the matter? Don't worry. The Almighty heard the cry of the child, and I'll make him a great nation. She angel points her out to the well. She, she drinks and gives the drink to her son, and essentially the epilogue of the story of Ishmael. They travel to the desert of Paran, and he gets married, and we don't really meet him again, besides for the funeral of Abraham, where we are given a description of the funeral procession, and Ishmael makes an appearance, but really, and he makes an appearance as well with his son-in-law, Esau. Esau marries one of his daughters, which is an alliance that just goes crazy, as you might imagine. But that's really the end of the story. The Parsha concludes with the binding of Isaac, where again God tells Abraham to take his son, his only son, the son that he loves, Isaac, and go to the land of Moriah and bring him there as an offering upon one of the mountains which I shall tell you. And again, Abraham wakes up in the morning. He saddles his donkey. Again, he's forced to do something he doesn't not happy to do at all. And he does it with alacrity. He takes his people with him. He takes the wood and he takes, and they travel to the place. They see the mountain. He says to his, to his people, stay here with the donkey. We're going to go up. I want to come back down. As they're traveling up the mountain, we have the only conversation recorded between Abraham and Isaac. Throughout the Torah, Abraham is a very dynamic figure. Only once do they have a conversation, and it's right here, as they're heading up the mountain with the paraphernalia for child sacrifice. And Isaac tells to his father, Father, and he said, Here I am, my son. And Isaac says, wait, you have the fire, you have the wood, you have the knife, where's the animal? And Abram tells him, "Mm, if we don't find an animal, you'll be an okay replacement. In fact, the Torah tells us only eight words that Abraham spoke to Isaac. That's it. Nowhere else is there a conversation recorded between Abram and Isaac. And they arrive to the place, Abram builds the altar, he arranges the wood, he binds Isaac, he places him on top of the altar, top of the wood. He takes the knife. As he's about to do it, an angel of Hashem calls out from heaven, Abraham, Abraham, Hineni, here I am. Don't stretch your hand out against the lad. Don't do to him anything. Now I know that you're a God-fearing man, since you have not withheld your son, your only one, from me. Abraham looks around and behold, he sees a ram. The ram is, is stuck in the trees. He takes the ram he supplants that for Isaac. He renames the mountain. He gets first another blessing from the angel. And they go back down the mountain and the Parsha ends. What do we make of this? We start off the Parsha with Abraham's overwhelming kindness. We end the Parsha with Abraham's overwhelming, perhaps we could say, cruelty. His own son, who was at the time probably around 15 or 16 years old, is being a little rowdy, and God instructs him to banish him, send him out. Your own son, who, who does that? Abraham is so kind to strangers, and now he's being told to his own son to be unkind to? And of course, the description of the Torah at the end, where he's told to, to go slaughter his own son, is obviously very perplexing. Why, and Abram is going ahead to do that. He's going to try to kill his own son, which is a tremendously unkind act. I want to try to build a little model here to try to understand this. There's a strange statement in the Talmud that describes a library of Abraham. Abraham had a library, and in the book of a Zarah, of idolatry, that he had, there was, there was 400 chapters. We have a Talmud, Abram had a Talmud. Our book of Avodah Zarah of idolatry in the Talmud consists of five chapters. His 
was 80 times larger. It contained 400 texts. That's where it's told. A very strange statement. But what does this tell us about Abraham, his character, his greatness, his persona? In the Shabbos morning prayers, there's a statement that we say, there is no value as the val- as your value, as God's value in this world, but there's nothing besides you in Olam Abba in the next world. What this is saying is as follows. Our life here, it's a world of choices. When someone makes a choice, it's between two things that you want. If I say, do you want the pizza or do you want the spinach and you only like the pizza, it's not really a choice. You don't have to grapple at all. You have one thing you like, one thing you dislike, and clearly there's no choice to be made. Additionally, if you could have both sides, you, you want the pizza and the ice cream, and both of them is our, 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 both of them are on the table, that you can, you have an option to select both, that's also not a choice. A choice is only when you have one thing that you want, and you have another thing that you also want, and you can only have one of them. How do we make choices? We make choices based upon pre-existing values. This world is a world where everyone can determine for themselves what's important and how important things are. Some people could say, and we know a lot of people, I'm sure, like this, the elections are so important. Spend a lot of time listening and reading and watching about these things. It's so important. Other people say, I don't really care. It doesn't matter. Well, what's the difference? One of them chose, however they chose is a separate question, they chose to assign high importance, high value to politics, and the other one didn't. Some people are into music or into stamp collecting or into sports, or right? Everyone has the things that they're knitting or television show, right? Everyone has things that are important to them. And also, everyone has a hierarchy of what's more important, what's less important. So if I say, your life or a cup of coffee, everyone's like, oh, life's worth more, right? It's not really a choice. Because, well, it is a choice because I want the coffee, I want my life, but my life is really worth so much more than the coffee. A real choice, a difficult choice, is someone says your life or your faith. Both of them are very high on the hierarchy. But the choice is a reflection of the pre-existing system, set of values. If I value God above all, that's the highest value, then if there's any conflict between God and any other value, I choose the higher the higher priority, the higher value, and that's God, and that's why it's more important than my life. It's more important than anything. We declare every Shabbos morning there is no value, like your value, God, in this world. This world where we can assign hierarchy to values, we're telling God, you're the highest value. And in fact, what's idolatry? Idolatry, almost by definition is any value that's higher than God. If God is not the top value, then whatever is higher than God is more important than God, right, by definition. Anything that's more important than God is idolatry. So if there's a conflict between the highest value and God, wherever that falls along your totem pole, well, you'll choose the higher value because that's what we do. We choose what's more important. And therefore, that is by definition idolatry. So we have five chapters in the Book of Vodazara that describe all the things that can potentially be higher than God in our priorities. Because for us, we declare there's no value like God. God's the top of our totem pole. Abraham had a much more exhaustive detailing of what was considered idolatry. 80 times larger. Why? In Abraham's worldview, not only was God the top priority, the top value in his value chain, he was the only value. Furthermore, it wasn't just uh, the assignment of actions. It wasn't that, that, that he would just do mitzvahs because he wants to do what God does, but even motivations. So kindness, for example. We saw already that Abraham's kindness was all predicated on his faith. Kindness was an actualization of his sole value, which is God. He had only one value, which is God, and that was manifest by kindness. But kindness in itself as its own independent entity didn't exist. It was only a reflection of his faith. Lot had kindness irrespective of God. He says, I'll stay for the night and then wash your feet. Abraham, he said, no, first thing is, the only thing really is God, and therefore, the kindness is only a reflection of that, and therefore, every kindness has to be uh, out of faith. How does such a person get tested? Everyone loves their sons. Everyone loves their children. 
Why do we love our children? Well, animals love their children as well. It's not a human, it's not necessarily limited to humans. There's something that we have naturally that we love our children. Abraham would call that idolatry. Only God matters. Of course, this is for Abraham, not for us. We love our children, okay? Just keep it like that. If you hear voices to tell you to go kill your kid, don't. <laughs> Abraham, anything that exists independent of God in Abraham's world, that was part of the 400 chapters of idolatry. Kindness. To do kindness on its own, as if it exists independent of God, Abraham would call that idolatry. If we would look at that, we'd say, whoa, that's kindness. Abraham would look at that and say, that's idolatry. Because to Abraham, anything that was not God, anything that was not motivated by God, that would be rendered idolatry. That's what Ab- that's the way Abraham worked. So how was he tested? God says to him like this, oh, you're kind, but you're only kind because of, because of faith. Well, what if God tells you to become unkind? That's the test to see, is the motivation for your kindness really exclusively God? Or is there any kindness on its own right? Is there any realm of the motivation for your kindness based upon kindness alone? How do we find that out? God will tell you to do an unkind act, like send away your son. What does Abraham do? He listens to God. Wakes up in the morning, motivated. To hit Abraham was as excited to send away his son as he was to do a mitzvah, to do the kindness with three angels masquerading as men. Both of them are doing the will of God. What does it matter? The only motivation was God, after all. He woke up early for both of them. He was excited and eager to do both of them. Comes along the binding of Isaac's story. God had already told him, Isaac is going to be your legacy. You're going to have your own kid. It's not going to be Lot. Who's going to be your heir? It's going to be Isaac. He already banked that. Plus, Abraham made a career out of fighting the pagans and fighting their practices. And one of the practices was child sacrifice. Plus, Abraham was just a kind person. But every good philosophy, every good behavior, every good deed of Abraham was because of God. Therefore, the ultimate test is do unkind things, do child sacrifice, renege upon your own legacy, all that because of God said. And you know what? Abraham woke up early. He was eager. What's the conclusion? God tells him, now I know you're a God-fearing man. Really? You didn't know that till now? Abraham made a career out of teaching the world about, about God. The point is, is that now any vestiges of doubt as to whether or not Abraham really had only one priority in his world, only God, only that mattered, now it becomes clear with this last test. The whole part is really about kindness. Indeed, the beginning is Abraham's overwhelming kindness with no material benefits. The end is Abraham's overwhelming faith, you know, with, with no kindness, it seems. All that, it's really unified to us. It seems, like, it seems like it's a tale of two Abrahams. It's the kind Abraham, and it's the cruel Abraham, the beginning, of, uh, beginning to the end of the parsha. The truth is, it's only one Abraham. It's an Abraham of faith. It's manifested in overwhelming, over-the-top kindness. It's manifested with even w- a willingness to eschew love of, of children and to walk away from his own legacy and to engage in child sacrifice. It's really, it's really unimaginable. But really, there's one core unified... Abraham, and that's the Abraham of faith. And indeed, it's a, it's a lesson for us, perhaps, that uh, we should try to follow in his footsteps, to try to continually upgrade our faith. How do you upgrade your faith? Well, you try to make your book of idolatry even bigger, right? You know, we have to look at what's a higher priority for us in our life that's higher from God. Well, that's idolatry. That's that's already our definition of idolatry. It's hard for, like, someone says, your life or God. It's hard for us to say God, because we like our life a lot. And we're conditioned to like our life. But the truth is, we have to, we, we recognize that how can anything be more important than God? What's the purpose of our life? The purpose of our life is to be able to worship the Almighty. And we say the Shema with intention to give up our life. Behold, behold, nafsha with all our soul. What are we saying? We're saying that God is the priority, the top priority, even higher than ourselves, our family, everything. But that's, that, that's a work for us. Once we get there, we realize that until we're at Abraham, there's always room for growth. We can never say, oh, you know what? I reached the top of the mountain. I'm there. Unless we're on the top of the mountain with Abraham, which I guarantee you we won't get, there's room for improvement. Abraham's an inspiration for us in kindness, what it means to notice the, the needs of others, to try to uh, open our hearts to the needs of others, 
to expose ourselves to what they're going through and to combat our Yetzirah in that way and to really live out, so to speak, the ideas of fighting the Yetzirah and undoing the sins of Adam. It's indeed reflected by our Brismil, our circumcision, and it is the legacy and the destiny of the Jewish people. I'll see you guys next week.